QSO Today episode 241, Joe Lynch, N6CL. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest HF, VHF, and UHF transceivers for the radio amateur, who are excited to announce the new IC9700 VHF, UHF, and 1200 MHz all-mode transceiver. More on this later. And by QRP Labs, Hans Summers G0 UPL's kit company, and creators of many fine radio kits, including the popular QCX transceiver. Please support the QSO Today podcast by supporting these fine sponsors. Links to both of these are on this week's show notes page. Click on the images. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth Forzad, 1UG, your host. My QSO today is with Joe Lynch, N6CL, who began his ham radio story over 50 years ago in the San Diego area of California. After a stint in Vietnam and a career as an amateur radio journalist for CQ magazine focused on VHF and above and as a minister, Joe is now the director of religious education at the United States Military Academy in West Point, New York. Both he and his wife, Carol, are active ham radio operators. N6CL has always been active in amateur radio emergency services, including at the site of the 1995 bombing of the Federal Building in Oklahoma City. This and more in this QSO today. N6CL, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Joe? 4Z1UG, N6CL. Joe, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? I was living in Bonita, California, a suburb of San Diego in the country. And I had a fascination with radios. One time I was walking around the neighborhood and I saw this antenna, tall tower. So I went over to the house and walked up and into the backyard, saw this building in the back and I uh, saw a man inside. I knocked on the door and I said, are you can you tell me about the radio? And he invited me in. I was all of 10 years old. And uh, he showed me uh, these massive radios, and I was wide-eyed, and he had me sit down, and, and uh, he said, don't touch anything. Just listen. Well, no sooner did he turn his back, I was touching everything, and he turned around and he said, uh, I don't want you to come back here until you learn how to not touch anything. So that was my first introduction to ham radio. And do you remember who he was? That was Cliff Evans, K6BX. Cliff Evans, K6BX. Yes. And did he become your, your Elmer, your mentor for ham radio? No. It was about three years later that a new neighbor, next door neighbor, came uh, moved in. And I saw that I knew enough about ham radio that there were call signs and uh, he had his call sign on his truck. <clears throat> so I went over there and I said, are you a ham radio operator? And he said, yes. And that was Earl K6SMT. And so I said, I want to become a ham radio operator. And he says, okay, we'll come in and uh, we'll talk about it. And uh, he told me what it was necessary to do to study up for those days. Uh, uh, you start off with the novice license. This was 1960. And, uh, then uh, that was a very simple theory and uh, five words per minute code test. And he had code records. So he said, you're going to have to learn the Morse code. So he began, he sat me down and uh, started off sending Morse code to me and telling me what he was sending. And then he put code records on and I began to learn how to copy them. And then he went over the exam with me. And finally, when he finally felt I was ready enough to take the exam, he sent to the FCC for the exam. And back in those days, a novice license was given by a volunteer examiner. And so the exam came and he opened it up and uh, had me take the test. And then he sent me a code test and uh, he certified that I'd passed the code test and he sent the exam in. And six, eight weeks later, uh, on early January of 1961, I got my license in the mail. It was with WV6PDE, Whiskey Victor 6 Papa Delta Echo. And it was dated December 28, 1960. So I now I had a license. Now I was gonna, by this time, I had made an acquaintance with some of the hams in the neighborhood. And 
there was a guy who was a year ahead of me in junior high school, and he said, as soon as you get your license, let me know, and I'll have you come over to my house, and we'll make you can make a contact. So I, I rode my bicycle over to his house, and I called him on the phone first and rode my bicycle over to his house, and he said, he, I showed him my license, and he said, okay, sit down in here. I've talked to a friend of mine in El Cajon, and he's standing by. He wants to make a contact with you. So I sat down at his station and um, began uh, sending my his call sign and my call sign, and this guy have, came back to me as WV6OTC, and we had our first, first QSO, and that was it. Well, that's pretty cool. Did you belong to a ham radio club then? I did not. It was about um, a, about a year later that I became acquainted with the South Bay Amateur Radio Society in Chula Vista, California. And so I would go to the, their club meetings, and, and I was the youngest ham radio operator there and uh, learned uh, <clears throat> about uh, the club work there. And 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 then I was not, during that first year, I was uh, very in, uh, in wanting to upgrade to get my general. And so uh, I got acquainted with a, a, a fellow classmate who had moved in from his, – his parents – his father was in the Navy, and uh, he moved in, and he had a call sign, a, a Midway call sign. He'd come in from Midway. And uh, so we palled around a little bit, and I told him I was wanting to upgrade, and he said, well, he wanted to upgrade too. So his mother took us down to the FCC office. So we could take our tests, and I passed, and he did not pass, and he lost interest in ham radio, and so that went away for him. But I continued my interest, and and I had made acquaintance with a ham radio operator in Chula Vista uh, who owned a furniture store. His name was Bernie Burns, W6BIG, and he had, in the back of his furniture store, he had rows and rows and rows of surplus parts, and he told me when I got my general, he would give me a radio. And so he gave me a radio, a TCS radio, and uh, he brought it over to the house and set it up. And so I got on the air on on uh, 80 meters uh, AM and started talking to the uh, guys that were mobile, going to work and coming home from work. Uh, so that was the beginning of that. And I started meeting people and get, getting drawn into the AM radio club and getting drawn into um, – other things like emergency communications, and and uh, they had a bright idea to make this young guy an emergency coordinator. So I was the youngest emergency coordinator in San Diego County. Wow. And, uh, Can we go back a second? What's a TCS radio? It's a Navy surplus radio, um, and uh, they, there's two versions of it, TCS-6 TCS and TCS-12. Well, I had a, a TCS-6. And it's really a, basically a receiver and a transmitter that were bolted together. And so I, when I changed frequencies, I had to change uh, the VFO on one, and I'd have to change the VFO on the other to match them up. Okay, and you became an emergency coordinator of uh, in San Diego County? Yes. Uh-huh. Did you ever go to the EOC there? Yeah, and Yes. Uh, in National City, which was uh, the nearest town um they, we had a, we had a an EOC in the bunker there and the person who handled that was a uh, uh K6TFT bill and uh, he let me uh, get involved in that become an operator there and so in fact at one point uh they were remodeling the EOC so he was responsible for getting the equipment uh secured and he he let me use a bike Johnson biking and uh, Hammerlin Radio, that was part of the station there, took them over to my house, and so I had the, those radios to play with and and be on the air with as long as I checked in on the net and, uh, on Monday nights. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it sounds, sounds to me like um, your mentors and Elmers were really key to your success there in the early days. Absolutely. So your first rig then was the TCS? My first, very first rig was a home brew uh, rig, a 6L6 vinyl in it, and uh, an another ham radio operator who lived uh, nearby had loaned me an Army surplus receiver. So I had uh, the Army surplus receiver and this crisp controlled uh, 6L6 uh, radio that operated. It was on 80 and 40 meters, 
and uh, 30 watts uh, of all, all of 30 watts, and I had a folded dipole that uh, uh, WA6 BDW loaned me that up was for 80 meters, but I loaded it on uh, 80 meters and 40 meters and managed to work all the way in, from San Diego, California, all the way into uh, the Westchester area of New York. Did ham radio play a part then in the choices that you made for your career in education? Yes. Um, when I graduated from high school, um, there were friends of mine who had gone to work for the Navy as an apprentice electronics mechanic. This was, uh, the, and we're ramping up for the Vietnam War. So they were hiring people to become an electronic, uh, electro, eventual electronic mechanic. So an pr- apprentice electronics mechanic was a career path for me. I uh, applied for the position and eventually was qualified for it and selected in for the position in uh, October of uh, 1966. That's, no, 1965. I went to work on for the for the Navy and Na- North Island Naval Air Station and uh, began that career. And nine months later, the Army said, um, "We don't want you doing that anymore for a while. We want you to come with us and go to Vietnam." So I was drafted and. Uh, Went to Vietnam after a basic and AIT to uh, I went to communications uh, to operate a radio inside of a um, communications van and uh, so when I got to Vietnam I tried to figure out how I could get involved in the Mars station there. You were not enlisted in the U.S. Navy as an apprentice electronic mechanic. It was a civilian job, right? Yes. Ah, that's the reason that you were drafted then into the army. Yes. In spite of the fact that I was working for uh, the Navy, I could not get an exemption from the draft. And there was no way to enlist at that time in the U.S. Navy and hope to get into this program? No. uh, It was a civilian career path. Four years working as an apprentice electronics mechanic, you became an electronics mechanic and and, uh, worked uh, through – that would be a career path that I could could take. And I – so after I was um, – after I got out of the Army, I went back to work for the Navy because of, my job was saved for me. Uh, so I finished up my apprenticeship and then became an electronics mechanic, worked there for about 10 years, and decided I would make my fame and fortune in real estate, left civil service altogether. And that working in real estate didn't really work out too well, so I worked a lot of different jobs until finally uh, 35 years later – I went back to work in civil service, working for the Army. Now I'm working for the Army as a director for a, a religious education. Been here for five years. We'll get to that in a second. Let's go back to Vietnam. It's So you're a communications operator in a van in Vietnam. How did you become involved in Army Mars then? I was uh, – when I got to the base camp, I was with the 25th Infantry Division in Kuchi. I uh, noticed that there was a – big building with antennas on it, and I th- knew something about Mars. So I went over there and, and uh, poked around and said, is this some, the Mars station? And they, uh, the operator told me, yes, it was. And so I said, uh, how do I – I'm a ham radio operator. How can I uh, go to work here? And they said, well, we have to request you. I said, oh, so uh, how can you request me? And they said, well, we need to know more about you. So um, – I hung around the Mars station um, when, when I have time, had time off, but the uh, Army put me in uh, in a forward base operation, so I was away from uh, Kuchi uh, at a forward, uh, manning a one of a three-man team uh, inside of a communication van that was on top of a two-and-a-half-ton truck. They called them dupes and Fs. And so we, we uh, managed these uh, VHF uh, radios that were linked to uh, by twisted pair to telephones in the field, and then they were linked over the air on VHF uh, into the phone uh, network in, uh, in in Kuchi. So I did that for a year, and uh, then the Army said, if you extend for six months, then you can have free uh, 30 days free leave. So I said, okay, I'll extend for six months. But I want to stipulate that I be reassigned to the Mars station, and they said, "Okay, we'll we'll agree to that." So I went when I they uh, brought me back in, and just before 
about a month before I went on leave, I actually be, was reassigned to the Mars station and wor wor began working there. And then I had the, the rank and eventually became the NCOIC of the Mars station. So I was running the Mars station. Now, were there a lot of hams that were available to work Army Mars in Vietnam at the, in those days? There were uh, several. I mean, there were hams were available to work. Um, a few of uh, the we had about uh, five or six operators there. Some of them, uh, that was their career path. They and they ended up uh, being a Mars station in the states, and then eventually being in Vietnam at a Mars station. And in my case, I was I uh, managed to get into that. I had a couple of operators come in along the way who uh, were in the field and uh, were brought in uh, to uh, be reassigned to something, and they tested them, and they said, well, is there a possibility of, of communications? One of them was a ham, and so he, he fitted right in. Another one knew nothing about ham radio, so I had to train him and uh, um, how to operate the ham radio station and, uh, and learn how to be a Mars operator. So that was uh, that was my job, and then uh, when I came back from leave uh, after my six months, the Army had another deal that said if you had less than five months active duty left when you came back from Vietnam, you would be automatically released from active duty. So I extended another five or six months to get inside that window, because I was one I was wanting to get back to my Navy career, and I was not interested in. Um, being around in um, in the army any longer than I'd had to be. Now, when you got back into your navy career, uh, what kind of gear did you work on for the navy? Are you allowed to say? I worked on a variety of things as the apprentice. They they put me through a different shops all around uh, uh, North Island Naval Air Station. So I learned everything from uh, different kinds of equipment, communications equipment, test equipment, and then eventually I worked on. When I graduated and become I became an uh, electronics mechanic, I worked on the radar systems for the F-4 uh, planes and um, repairing uh, the, them and modifying them and upgrading them and, and so on. So I did that for a while, and then an opening came uh, at the, out at Point Loma at the Naval, Naval Ocean Systems Center for, for in the calibration lab. So, and I did that for about a year and a half, and then I. Uh, applied for a, a position as a tech writer, and um, the that position came open, but the supervisor wasn't willing to. Uh, he realized that he didn't needed a lot of training. He wasn't willing to do the training, so I decided that was the time for me to bail out and go work for uh, as as a real estate broker. And now this message from ICOM America. I'm so excited to be able to tell you about the new ICOM IC9700 SDR transceiver. ICOM had in mind the weak signal operator when it applied its DSP and direct sampling technology to the IC9700's receiver design, allowing the operator to dig out the faintest signals from moon bounce and meteor scatter contacts. The ICOM IC9700 is a tri-band VHF, UHF, and 1200 MHz transceiver. Operating modes include AM, single sideband, FM, CW, RTTY, and all of the digital modes. You can even use the IC9700 to talk on the local D-Star repeater, making it an ideal rig for exploring the amateur bands 2 meters and above. For the satellite operator, the IC9700 has dual independent receivers that allow full duplex crossband operation with normal and reverse tracking, and 99 memory slots for your favorite satellites. The IC9700 is beautifully appointed with an almost identical footprint to the IC7300. It will make a beautiful sidekick to your current HF rig in your shack. With its 4.3-inch color touchscreen, you can easily control the rig and find the band activity using the waterfall display. To learn more about the IC9700 or any of the other fine ICOM products, go to www.icomamerica.com forward slash amateur or click on the ICOM banner in this week's show notes page. And when you visit your local ICOM dealer to purchase your IC9700, be sure to tell them that you heard about it here on QSO Today. And now back to our QSO Today. In my research, um, it, it appears that you've been a ham radio journalist for many years. You co-wrote a comprehensive history of amateur radio post-World War II with Bill Orr, W6SAI, that was published in the 50th anniversary issue of CQ Magazine. 
How did that project start? That was started with uh, Rich Moseson assigning uh, both Bill and me the project. And so I worked on, it was the 50, the 50 years, I worked on 20 years, and Bill worked on 30 years. And we basically worked independently of each other. And I just worked, went through, uh, I had um, Microfish from uh, the from CQ. Uh, they sent me the Microfish and Microfish Reader. And I would go year by year and uh, pull out highlights and uh, write uh, about the highlights and then uh, pulled it all together and, and sent it in. Now, you've been a frequent contributor to CQ Magazine over the years. What was the area of interest that you made your biggest contributions? In uh, um, the 80s, I saw that they were looking for someone to uh, 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 to take over the VHF column. And so I called up there and asked if uh, uh, if they'd be interested in uh, this goes. I need to back up a little bit. Uh, the the Cliff Evans uh, K6BX was a publisher of the uh, Directory of Certificates and Awards, and so I learned about uh, print and then and learned about writing, and I eventually uh, started uh, the the Soapars Bulletin for a year uh, that was uh, for the Ham Radio Club, and so I edited an eight-page newsletter uh, for the Soapars Bulletin. So that. That was when the printer's ink got into my blood, and uh, I, uh, I was, just knew that at some point I was going to want to do that more, but uh, just kind of got away from me over the years until uh, in the 80s when uh, the opportunity came available, and I became the new uh, columnist for the uh, VHF Plus column for, for CQ Magazine and did that for 22 years. Now, were you already a VHF operator? I was to some de uh, to some degree, but um, uh, that was more that was where my specialty, my interest was leaning. And so then, when I became the editor, I learned I needed to embed my uh, you know and, and just uh, get really immerse myself into learning about that. So I started to going to uh, the various uh, organizations like the Central States VHF Society and other organizations and learning about them and writing about them and then talking about and calling up and talking to the, the people who were uh, the movers and shakers that call signs showed up and uh, I'd look at QST and see who was writing or who's who was doing what and I'd call them up and I'd ask them questions about it and so eventually um, I did that for um, about, well, about 10 years and uh, Dick uh, um, uh, Ross, K2MGA, said, uh, I wanted to bring back uh, CQ VHF magazine. Are you interested? And I said, yeah, I'm interested. So uh, we got together and we brought it back as a quarterly magazine, and I did that for about 12 years. Um, and again, uh, traveling around the country, going to ham radio conferences, and uh, it, we had an 84-page magazine that uh, I had – developed up to about 12 different regular writers and columnists and then I had about uh, five different people come in as uh, as uh, feature article writers and I always look for new talent I would, when I went out and to a ham radio conference I'd see somebody doing a project on something I'd say would you want would you like to write that up for CQVHF and so I'd work with them and mentor them on getting their stuff published now, did that become a full-time job for you? No, uh, it was part-time because it was a quarterly. At the same time I was doing that, I was teaching for um, as an adjunct instructor for um, a local university, and I was a part-time pastor of a United Methodist Church in uh, in Tulsa. So you were a jack of all trades then at that time. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Now. I, I, from my own experience, it seems to me I spend more time on ham radio making the QSO Today podcast than I do operating. Did you ever have a chance to build your own VHF and above station and work contests and be an operator? Oh, yeah, I did. Uh, I had quite an elaborate uh, um, antenna farm in my house in Tulsa, um, and and it was both HF and VHF. My, my wife is a also a ham. She's W6CL, and so she operates AF, HF and uh, did a lot of net operating, but I worked VHF, and I was mostly six meters and two meters and worked contests uh, there. And um, um, a, a little bit of rovering. I did uh, rover operations. Uh, there was uh, – I 
had a van that went out and then at, at one point along the way uh we i had got in touch with a ham radio operator in cuba arnie coral co2kk and i invited him to come to the central states vhf society when i hosted it in oklahoma city and so that, that was quite an adventure to get him up to be the the uh, guest speaker well he in turn invited me to go to havana and um and so that was um uh, a lot of hoops that we had to jump through because we had no working relationship with Cuba, but there was an exemption with the State Department. If you were a journalist, you could go to Cuba. So I went with a, a couple of friends of mine to Cuba for a joint Cuba-USA ham radio operation. And uh, how that, partially how that came about was when I, I was uh, going to Cuba uh, with the United Methodist Church to work on a church, a church building there. And so I got to be in Havana and uh, meet uh, the uh, Arnie uh, and, uh, and the ham radio operators there. And so he extended an invitation to me to come back the following year to for a joint Cuba-USA ham radio operation. So that's when we set up operation in outside of Havana, Havana and um, um, we were the first U.S. joint U.S. Uh, Cuba and radio operation, and we had clearance from the Cuban government to be on the air. We had uh, authorization to uh, use our call signs slash uh, or the CO2 slash our call signs, and then we were on the air. I worked with a local ham who was real interested in being a rover. So while the uh, main operation was at uh, uh, with CO2 uh, CO0. Uh, I forget the call sign, no, zero, zero VHF or something. Uh -huh. But I I worked with the local guy, and I beca we became a rover. COT, OJ, and I would go uh, set up and going. We were the first rover operation from Cuba, and we'd go to from one grid square to another and operate uh, as a rover. So that was a lot of fun. And so then six months later, um, I had the opportunity to go back again to uh, visit uh, – to work on the church again. So on my way uh, back from that mission trip, I had awards to present to the Ham Radio Club and we for the for their operation in the VHF QSO party. That's what that's what our, our operation occurred during the June VHF QSO party that year, 1995. Doesn't Arnie have a radio show? Isn't he a broadcaster from Cuba? Radio Havana, Cuba. Radio Havana. Yes. I think uh, I think Arnie's a listener to the QSO Today podcast. I've been in touch with him before. I hope to have him on sometime when uh, the internet connection improves enough that we can actually have a conversation. What is the VHF and Above Journal? Well, I had thought about starting a VHF and, and Above magazine when when I came up here to West Point. Uh, just as I arrived here, Dick decided to shut down CQ VHF magazine. And uh, so I took that. Uh, he wanted to he wanted to uh, continue it with me, but I could not take on the responsibility of doing that and a new job, full-time job. So I declined the offer to take over the, the CQ VHF and, uh, magazine. I would have transitioned it into, CQ, uh, into something like VHF and above, but uh, I put up a website thinking I was going to do something with it, but I've never – been able to have the time to do it. Instead, I write a VHF column for the Spectrum Monitor, which is a an online publication. And it's a great publication, by the way, for, for those listeners that aren't using it. I'll put a link to that in the show notes field. You received the Central States VHF Society Wilson Award in 2016. What is that award, and why did you receive it? It's an award for doing service to the hobby and to the to the society and to the hobby in general, and uh, my being the editor of CQ VHF magazine, and being uh, the VHF editor for CQ magazine uh, was the basis for receiving that award. It's it's uh, I was was very honored by that and uh, was not was surprised to receive it. Um, there's I feel like it's, it was something of that. that um, I wasn't expecting, but I understand why they gave it to me because I really did devote myself to the the world of VHF and tried to make uh, make people aware of it and tried to bring new people into it, and um, um, it was a fun ride. 
Do you have a favorite initiative, either technical or social, centered in the VHF and above range that you think has the greatest long-term benefit to amateur radio? Yes, um, ARIS. The uh, work that they're doing, especially with young people and the ARIS contacts, um, I published uh, articles about them. I published uh, articles by people who were participated in ARIS contacts and uh, the work that they're doing with young people uh, interesting them, interest in them in STEM, uh, science, science <clears throat> technology, uh, engineering, math uh, is just uh, phenomenal. And uh, this is a worldwide effort to bring young people into uh, further education and all and in space exploration. I, I think it's a it's a phenomenal way for young people to enter the hobby, as well as a, a well a way of um, having international friendship through ham, ham radio. So when you're referring to ARIS, you're talking about the um, space station, international space station contacts with kids in, in schools uh, facilitated yes. by ham radio? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing. Yeah. ARIS is amateur radio aboard the International Space Station, A-R-I-S-S. Uh-huh. And they they arrange uh, VHF or, or, I guess, VHF contacts between um, ground stations and the space station. Yes, there's usually on on two meters, and uh, they make arrangements with uh, a mentor who's um, involved with them, and they set up with a school and set up a station at the school and and um, get on the air there uh, for a ten minute contact. The kids are prompted to write questions, and the questions are sent up to uh, the the astronaut ham radio operator, and uh, so those are those are the uh, the parameters for doing that. What's the best ham radio magazine now for following the world above 50 megahertz? There really isn't one. Um, I, I, you know, you, I agree with you with that uh, the Spectrum Monitor is a great magazine, but it's a great general coverage magazine, and I have just one column in there that's among the so many other columns on so many other uh, activities and communications. But as far as a magazine covering a VHF and above, there isn't. So there's a there's an opening in the media in the ham radio media for a, a new magazine if someone wants to do it. That's right. I'm too busy to do it now. It's my understanding that you were in the Oklahoma area, Oklahoma City area, at the time of the eight, April 1995 bombing of the federal building there. What role did amateur radio communications play in the aftermath of that bombing? At that time, I was the section manager for Oklahoma, and I was. Um, in the in the area, I heard the explosion, and I went down to. I had a meeting with a, a friend of mine in um, in in nearby area. So I went to his office, and uh, he was not there. But people people were crowded around a television. I looked at the television, and I saw the building, and so I went back home, got my ham radio station, and went downtown, and uh, hooked, pulled in alongside the. Of the Oklahoma City Mobile EOC, and uh, went up to the uh, van where I saw a friend of mine who was a police officer and a ham radio operator, and also somebody we went to I went to church with, and he said, um, "Get up in here, we need you in here." So uh, I jumped inside the van, and there was a ham radio operator already in there. So we we set uh, set up a station inside of the EOC and began coordinating the. Uh, uh, various NGOs, non-government organizations that were setting up around the perimeter. And so I was giving information to my friend uh, who was putting these in, the NGOs on a map, and uh, the other guy was operating. And so uh, that lasted for the for the first day. Later in the day, uh, we shut down. Uh, that part was shut down, so I got, back, got into my van. And... Um, Operated catty corner across the street as um, we had tactical communications, providing communications for the Salvation Army that provided uh, uh, snacks and other things and food for the volunteers who were inside the perimeter. So I worked there for my wife, uh, who was my fiance at the time, joined me a, a couple of days later. And so we did a, I had a uh, conversion van uh, that. Um, we operated out of the ham radio equipment there, and in the back was a bed. And uh, so we'd work 24-hour uh, shifts just uh, straight through 
providing communi uh, communications for the uh, uh, through the central area uh, that was um, coordinated. Uh, it was all coordinated over a uh, two meter uh, repeater, and so we'd ask for meals to come in or other things to come in, like uh, body bags for the casualties that they were pulling out of there. And so altogether, we had 300 volunteers participate in that uh, process for the about the 10 days that we were in rescue and then later in recovery. So uh, uh, we had ham radio operators come in from Texas, Oklahoma, uh, across the state in Oklahoma, Kansas, and other areas uh, uh, volunteer and be a part of that operation there. It was uh, it was uh, very ten intense and but and very uh, um, satisfying to know that we were doing something very important, providing communications. Cell phone communications were down. You know, people could have not make contact, and so we were the communications providing uh, the uh, backbone communications until finally. The cell, uh, one of the cell phone companies came in there, set up a tower inside the perimeter so people can make their cell phone calls. Are you still involved in uh, emergency coordination and uh, this kind of EMC work now? Not really. Um, my my time is pretty much working for the Army and uh, uh, with my full-time time, time of, uh, being uh, uh, as a director of religious education. I'm more involved in uh, my own experimentation. I've had time when I've had time alone or uh, time off work, I will build antennas. I've built a lot of uh, VHF and UHF antennas, uh, loops and quads and things like that, and tested them out here and, the, and worked contests with them here. And, and just that's uh, been my activity. Let me take a quick break here to tell you about my favorite amateur radio audio podcast, the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast with George, KG6VU, and Jeremy, KF7IJZ where they pursue topics, technology, and projects on their ham radio workbenches every two weeks. George and Jeremy document their projects and make circuit boards available for sale to their listeners. They have interesting guests and go in deep. Even if you're a seasoned ham radio builder, or just getting started, be sure to join George and Jeremy for the Ham Radio Workbench podcast. Use the link on this week's show notes page by clicking on the image. And now back to our QSO today. What's the current rig? Um, I have a 7300, and I have a um, the, the FT736. Uh, that's the that's my basically my station right now, and I'm drooling all over the 9700. Yeah, that 9700 will look really nice next to the IC7300. Yes, yeah, so there's a place waiting for it, but yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for one too. I'm pretty excited by it. So the other thing we're doing here, we've discovered mm -hmm. a an internet-based SDR radio network. That uh, for my wife, who's uh, had to give up her being a net control operator in Oklahoma when she moved, up, we moved up here. Uh, we've discovered this network, so I will tune in a, a receiver that is in the area in Texas, and uh, so she can listen to her friends on the SDR receiver. And at the, but there's one network in the in the morning, uh, the uh, daytime Texas traffic net, that there's one operator in Missouri that has a strong enough signal that we I'm able to connect with him directly. And so uh, it's fascinating to listen to him this on, on 70, on uh, 40 meters, 7285. So yeah, we'll listen to it. I'll talk to him on the, uh, directly, but then we'll have a receiver set up so that uh, I'll hear a little bit of a delay. And, and if I, depending on the, re on the, if I pick like someplace in like Fort Rucker, I'll hear myself. Uh, as well, uh, uh, on a little bit of a delay, as well as a net control. So that's that's one way of uh, keeping active in the hobby. You just mentioned that you're the director of religious education at the U.S. Army Garrison in West Point. Yes. Well, what, what does that job entail? It seems to me that a guy like you might be retired now. Well, <laughs> um, maybe that's hard to do. It's yeah, for me, it's hard to do. Um, uh, we support um, uh, um, there with the. Uh, my job is responsibility of supporting the religious education of the various faith groups here uh, at our post. And the faith groups are, can be Protestant, Catholic, uh, Jewish, and uh, Muslim, and as well as other underserved uh, faith groups like Buddhism and, and uh, uh, Latter-day Saints and so on. So our responsibility is support to support them with religious education 
materials and uh, some maybe curriculum writing for their uh, activities. Now, do you bring in speakers and uh, and chaplains of other faiths in order, you know, to, to supplement that for you? Well, I'm part of the unit a minute. Unit ministry team, uh, which I'm comprised of a chaplain and a a family life chaplain and a Catholic faith chaplain, a Jewish faith chaplain. And so they they provide the ministry, the services for the various faith groups, and we provide the religious education. And um, this week, though, is the the prayer breakfast, and they are responsible for bringing in a speaker for the prayer breakfast. And, And in the past, we've had to people from different faiths, like I think in one year it was Jewish, but I'm not sure what this year's um, how faith is. But uh, I'm looking forward to meeting with him because he is also a Vietnam veteran. So we'll have some time to have some conversation about our, our uh, experiences in Vietnam. As a director of religious education at West Point, which um, I, I would – seem to think that West Point probably attracts the best and the brightest that the United States has to offer in terms of young people who come to West Point. Are you optimistic about the future? Absolutely. We have uh, 4,400 cadets. Each year we bring in about 1,100 cadets. We have the the United States Military Academy and the United States Military Academy Prep School, four, and they have about 250 students. They're cadet candidates. There are young young men and women who may have a deficiency in one area of education, like in the math deficiency or something like that. So they're given a year and special tutoring and working with them to get them up to speed with that. And if they make it, then they they come in a, in the first year in the academy. It's a four year program. There's about 140 different degrees that these young men and women can specialize in, and they graduate. And after four years as second lieutenants, and they are, they provide the officers uh, for the Army. And the young men and women we work with are just uh, stellar people. I've been thoroughly enjoyed. In fact, um, um, there's a ham radio club as part of it, and uh, the group of us, a, local, uh, a, a, local, a group of local ham radio operators have teamed up with us here as volunteer examiners, and we've been able to get about 60 cadets licensed uh, in the hobby. Wow, so you have an active ham radio station there at West Point? Yeah, W2GKY. Well, that's pretty they're amazing. More active, more active on Mars than they are in the, on the club. Uh, it's occasionally one of the professors over there will go over and get on the air, but uh, I got my own station here. I don't need to go over there and get on the air. Is, is the West Point station an old station, or is this a, a relatively no. new development for West Point? Well, the old yeah, it's an old station. It's been around for a long time. Uh, it was like 50 years or plus uh, maybe 60 years and uh there's a you you can look up the history uh, on the on the uh, west point uh, website um uh just look for the, the ham radio club in there and there's some history there but uh the uh, but the station is a modern station they have flex flex radio station there and they're in the process of putting up a tower uh, in the near future do you find working with generation z any different from the uh maybe the Generation Xers or the uh, Millennials that have come through West Point? Well, Millennials are our dominant class. In fact, this is a, the this incoming class for uh, West Point is the last Millennial class. So I can't really say anything about working with Generation Z. We've been told uh, they're, they're somewhat uh, different parameters in working with uh, them, but uh, that's kind of uh, like – we're all going to learn about that together. How about that? You know, it's, uh, this is the week, I think, of Valentine's Day when we're recording this. And I understand that your meeting your wife, Carol, W6CL, is another ham radio love story. Can you tell that? Yes. I was uh, helping a man work on his uh, – I was mentor- I, here I was, a junior high school kid, mentoring uh, an, a man – on him learning the code so that he could his, get uh, his upgrade his license from being a novice to a general. And so he had me over to his house for the week, and I would spend the day with him, and then I would in the evening I would get on the air. And so one evening I got on the air and uh, started working on CW, and I heard a 
KN5 CP, uh, KN, uh, KN5 CPZ. So I began to have contact with her. No, it was K5 CPZ because they were both in the generals by then. And uh, so I began a contact with her, and uh, eventually we continued our contacts for a while. And and then that uh, after about that lasted for about three or four years, and then we lost touch with each other. But then there was a tornado in Drumwhite, Oklahoma, where she was from, and so I went sought her to see if uh, what was going on, if everything was okay, and and uh, made contact, reconnected with her, and then eventually stayed in touch with her, and and then moved from San Diego to Oklahoma, and uh, started going to working on my MBA degree at Oklahoma City University, but. Um, Carol was dating two other guys at the time, so I was like number three, but I outlasted them. And finally, she said, um, okay, we might get serious if you, you get yourself a real job. And so I started looking into that possibility, but uh, but that's when I started looking into becoming a minister. So I told her I was going to become a minister, and uh, she said, oh, dear, that's not what I was thinking about for a real job for you. But she decided that if that's what is going to be his career, then I'll be a, I'll be supportive of him. And so uh, she was very supportive of me for the, through uh, the three years of seminary. And then I, I told her that in our denomination, we were appointed to a, a, a church and that if we didn't get married, they'd be liable to be appointing me to the panhandle of Oklahoma and she'd never see me again. Well, she bought that idea. Mm-hmm. And so we... We uh, went off to to Arkansas and um, got married there and came back and st- uh, settled down, finished up. I had to finish up uh, three more months of seminary, and I was appointed to a church in the Tulsa area while she was still teaching in the Oklahoma City area. So we did have a year of where she had one more year to finish up before she could retire, and then she joined me in, in the Tulsa area as uh, my – I was – and the commuter marriage kind of uh, was over. So then I was pastoring. I was an associate pastor for the first year, and then I had my own church, and we were there for 14 and a half years when I uh, retired from there and got this job up here. So it was love at first did in my uh, my estimation, but she says to me, don't flatter yourself. So there was a lot of time between the first contact and the time that you actually got married. Yes, decades. Decades, wow. Well, that's that's quite a story. And now this message from QRP Labs. QRP Labs has shipped thousands of QCX QRP transceivers kits to date. The odds of working another QCX user gets better every day. If you're looking for a satisfying kit experience where you end up with an amazing performing QRP transceiver for under $50, let me say that again, for under $50, then you owe it to yourself to go to QRP Labs. We have many home brewers who listen to the QSO Today podcast. For you, QRP Labs also has parts, filters, enclosures, and other handy devices to make your home brewing experience even better. You can use these parts to either enhance your QRP Labs kits or to beef up your own homebrew designs. Be sure to browse Han's entire website. Use the link on this week's show notes page or the one in the sponsored section of the QSO Today website to get to QRP Labs to buy your QCX or any of the other fine QRP Labs kits or parts. QRP Labs is my go-to ham radio kit company. It should be yours, too. QRP Labs. And now back to our QSO Today. Do you have his and her operating positions in your QTH? Well, yes and no. Um, I've set up a K, uh, the uh, Ellercraft K-Line uh, in the, in, in the uh, dining room area in the kitchen, and uh, we both operate that. That's her station, right? No, that's her station, yes. Uh-huh. We both okay. operate that station, the K3 okay. and the, and the, K, the CAT uh, the 500 and the uh, KP500 there. And, so, uh, and then in, the, in a bedroom, I have my VHF station. And where does the 7300 sit? In the bedroom. Okay, so in theory, you you both could be operating at the same time. Yes, we could. Do you have bandpass filters in order to be able to do that? Well, we're so rarely doing that. Too. She's more uh-huh. interested. Um, when I'm on the air on VHF, she's sitting in there listening to all the six meter DX I'm working. What's the West Point Center for Oral History, and how are you involved in that? I was asked to uh, to uh, give uh, uh, to to set for an interview because I am there. They have um, 
they're bringing in veterans and of uh, various wars to get their story. And the Center for Oral History is to document uh, people who are, are veterans and they get their story about uh, how they served in whatever capacity and what their life story is. And and I just happen to know the person who is involved in that because uh, he was a member of the congregation of the of uh, the church that I served as a DRE. So here he heard about, you know, I'm t- always talking about being a Vietnam vet. And so he said, why don't you come and sit down and tell us your story sometime? So, and you did, apparently. Yes. Okay. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes page because it's a very interesting uh, uh, history that you tell beyond what, what you're hearing today on QSO Today. What do you think is the greatest challenge facing amateur radio now? We have to go back to talking about millennials. Um, it's we have to figure out a way to make amateur radio attractive to uh, the young people who are coming up, millennials, Generation Z, uh, make it amateur radio attractive to them. And uh, there's a whole different um, – I mean, in some ways, it's the same, but it's a whole different uh, perspective because they they have a, a different mindset about um, priorities and so on. But they're also very curious about things, and they do. And the maker movement has been like uh, it's like a throwback because we ham radio operators, uh, when I was growing up in the 50s and the 60s, we were the first makers of ham radio. So I um, mean, uh, today, so here we are today. Uh, so in some cases, mentoring these young people who are building their own ham radio sets out of uh, um, the new things that are available. So that that goes back to talking about Eris uh, earlier. That is trying to find a way of uh, making ham radio attractive. There's you know there's there's we haven't been able to put the set, uh, the sizzle on the steak very well yet. Right. I think there's this idea that um, you know the radio just works. So if they're carrying around a cell phone, they don't perhaps understand exactly. the, the size of the networks that are involved just to support it versus uh, running a QRP rig with a piece of wire hanging from a tree. That's exactly right. So the wow factor might be, you know, it's, it's, I remember as a kid being absolutely wowed by ham radio. Um, but I think they you know that we have to come up with a different wow factor perhaps. Exactly. Yeah. What excites you then the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? Well, it, it's the advancing in technology. The SDR is uh, I, I'm, when when uh, Gerald Youngblood was work, beginning to work on his project, the Flex Radio project. Uh, he was just we happened to be at the same place at the same time, and so Carol and I had lots of time to talk to him uh, when he was uh, talking about his uh, his first uh, five, uh, Flex 500, and then later on the, the other variations of it, and so. Watching that uh, evolve has been fascinating, and now uh, here we are um, uh, 10, 15 years later, and the SDR radio is used in so many different uh, uh, venues and uh, applications, and we're just continuing to discover new ways of of, uh, communicating, and and then, you know, there's uh, Joe Taylor and his uh, all of his uh, different kinds of uh, software, way, uh, different kinds of, of uh, communications like FT8 is really hitting uh, uh, very popular right now, and I've made a few contacts on using FT8 on on both NHF and V and six meters, and uh, so there there's a the the so- the interest in software, the interest in uh, firmware, and the interest in and radio communications has been really pulling uh, people along in, in the hobby. You know, there's nothing new about propagation. You know, it's it's either going to happen or it's not going to happen. Although we are getting really into the doldrums on on the sunspot cycle now, and and the propagation predictions are that we're not going to be seeing any good sun, solar cycles for quite some time to come. So we need to find other ways to to uh, use the hobby. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, it, it seems that every contest weekend there seems to be a lot of uh, propagation, if you will. Yes. So maybe we're all being too quiet out there. We're all waiting for the call rather than making the call. Oh, yeah. What do you think about that? Well, we noticed uh, this past week uh, different stations. We we uh, listened late at night or something, and we noticed different stations would be on the air 
and then I'd say, oh, that station is on the air from uh, Martinique because uh, they're testing their equipment for the contest coming up this weekend, this past weekend. And so, you know, we heard stations um, uh, that would be on the air, but and, and really propagation – Propagation on 80, 40 meters uh, is, uh, for between here and Europe is uh, is there all the time. Um, so, you know, if you want to talk to somebody, you just gotta, you just hope somebody's there to talk to. But a lot of times there's nobody to talk to because they're they're not they're not listening for you. Have you operated FT8? Yes. Uh huh. What do you think of that mode? I think it's fascinating. Yeah, it's, I do too. Uh, uh, it, it's amazing um, that how it does work around the world, even yes. at the bottom of the sun, sunspot cycle. Well, I'm also I'm just beginning to look into Whisper uh, and uh, the, the long range propagation there. It's, that's that's something I want to learn more about. Uh, Soda Beams was a sponsor uh, early early on, and they have a little device. It's like a hundred milliwatt uh, Whisper transmitter that you use to test your antennas, and uh, surprisingly, that thing can talk all over the world. What advice would you give to newer returning hams? It's it's a fun hobby for returning hams. We're still here. Um, there's uh, there's plenty of uh, activity to do uh, in ham radio and soda. You mentioned soda. That's uh, they're they're getting a lot of people involved in soda, meaning in so, uh, summits on the air, uh, getting people involved to get out and, and set up a portable operation on a mountaintop somewhere and those activities and uh, and learning how to operate um, you know minimal uh, operation. So the ham radio is still there for a per person coming back, uh, for a new person coming in. It's an opportunity to uh, get to meet some new people. Ham radio travels well. There are a lot of people who are have ham radios in their RVs, and and so you can pull, you can circle up and meet with a bunch of people in the ham radio and uh, be make eyeball QSOs. It's never been a better time to be a ham. Would you agree? I agree. Joe, it's been great to have you on the QSO Today podcast. I know that we scheduled, scheduled this some time ago, and apparently the weather caused a, a mishap for you. How are you feeling now? Um, well, I, I've learned how to operate. I broke my arm. The uh, upper right arm, was, it's a humerus bone, and so I, I tell, people, people, tell people I broke my humerus, but it wasn't very funny. <laughs> so I, I'm slowly on the mend. I'm staying home from work and keeping very busy. I'm taking courses from... Fordham University in religious education, and I'm working on a project for writing a Bible study for the movie Indivisible, which is about um, a, a chaplain who deployed to uh, Iraq and from out of Fort Stewart in 2007, and his experience and his, his family, wife and family experience. So um, we're, that's a project that uh, those things are keeping me very busy in spite of uh, so I've learned how to type with uh, one hand, learn how to move the mouse over on my left hand, uh, uh, and operating from that uh, way of doing things here. So it's, I, d I don't expect this going to be a permanent thing. Uh, I'm finding things are starting to stitch together in my in my uh, arm, and so I'll be back together again in about two months. In the meantime, I stay home and and keep busy staying home. We'll have a speedy recovery. And thanks again so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast, Joe. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much, Eric, for t contacting me and making it possible. 73. 73. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Joe. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put an N6CL in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to both ICOM America and QRP Labs for their support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of these fine sponsors by clicking on their links in the show notes pages or when you make your purchases that you say that you heard it here on QSO Today. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference. 
QSO Today is now available on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Libsyn, and TuneIn, as well as the iTunes Store. If you own an Amazon Echo, you can say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. I still use Stitcher to listen to podcasts on my smartphone. The links to all of these services are on the show notes pages on the right side. Until next time, this is Eric Forz at 1UG73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.